I will do my best to be audible this time. I apologize. <laughs> Strong start. <clears throat> Mayor, Ms. Brown, thank you for taking the time today. Thank you. Thank you. You've both lived in this community for decades and have been squarely in the public eye for much of that time. For those who have not already made up their minds about you, make your case as to why you're the right person to lead the city. Mayor, we're gonna start with you. Thank you, Emery, and thank you for everyone uh, for coming here tonight. Thank you for the Spokesman Review for putting this uh, important debate on. You know, my, uh, my first term in office uh, faced some unprecedented challenges, a global health pandemic, a summer of protests, defund the police movement, our first riot, um, housing crisis, and un unprecedented workforce shortages, inflation, and Camp Hope. Any one of those things um, would be difficult for uh, a new mayor or an experienced mayor. And uh, not coming from a place of politics, I love my city. And I am a former business owner, um, a journalist for 28 years in Spokane, knew my city, and am ext extremely proud at how I've been able to lead the city through all of those in their totality. And uh, we have some work to do. I wanna make sure that we stay uh, going down the right road and that we have a bright future and that we don't let the city of Spokane become like other cities up and down the West Coast. Ms. Brown. Thank you, uh, Gonzaga, no lie, spokesman review. Uh, the next mayor of Spokane should be an experienced, collaborative leader who takes responsibility and gets things done. I will be that mayor. I've spent 30 years uh, learning how to serve this community well, from the students I've taught, go Eags, go Zags, to the new medical school we created, go Cougs. Uh, you can see the way I've responded effectively to the ideas of the city, Crosswalk Youth Center up north, Fox Theater downtown. I stand up for things that matter, like a cleaner Spokane River and a diversified Spokane economy that creates good jobs. And I stand up for people that matter, like our LGBTQ community, our child care workers, our newly arrived Ukrainian refugees. No one will tell you that Spokane is better off on homelessness or public safety than we were four years ago. It's common knowledge that there has been division, dysfunction, and a budget crisis. There's a better way, and if you elect me mayor, we will find common ground and move forward. Well, what I would say to that is that the city of Spokane is um, not unique. Um, we are facing the challenges that cities across our state are, are facing. Homelessness has gone up. Homelessness has gone up across the state and under Lisa's leadership at Commerce to 25,000 statewide. Crime has gone up. We took tools away from officers. Crime has gone up. I fought and advocated to get those tools back. And cities across the county are, or across the state are dealing with budget crises right and left because the cost of doing business is expensive. Revenues are not keeping up with expenditures. It, it is what everyone is experiencing right now. I think it's really why we need collaborative leadership that knows how to work with federal and state resources uh, bring things to the, bring people and organizations together with those resources. There are a lot of good ideas here, but honestly, we have not been moving forward uh, the last four years. There have been a lot of division, and there's not a vision for the future, a plan that people can point to about where we're going with these, with these challenging issues of the unhoused population and the economic insecurity faced by many people in Spokane. I can change that with you. This region has a long history of being confronted with hate, whether the MLK March bomb threat, the legacy of the Aryan nations, and just recently we've seen a string of vandalization of LGBTQ symbols and organizations. What is the city's role in combating that hate? Lisa, we're gonna start with you. Well, the this, this city leadership and the city council uh, need to be exemplary in, in their own uh, statements and actions. I'm proud to have marched in the, in the first Pride March in Spokane in 1992 and to have been uh, an ally of our communities of color and of Sandy Williams as we developed the vision of the Carl Maxey Center and have marched in, in many MLK Day parades except when I was in Olympia. So I think that it's a leadership question and that 
it's more than that. It's bringing those voices to the table, being part of the decision-making process. I would do that starting with a transition committee after being elected and so that our policies more deeply reflect the engagement with those communities. Mayor. I think as, as leaders and certainly as mayor, um, I've been very vocal about the attacks recently um, on our street murals and uh, in the Perry District. We are better than that. Uh, I denounce hate of any kind against any group, whether it's BIPOC, Jewish, LGBTQ+. And the best way for a mayor to support diverse communities uh, in our city is through our hiring process. On my cabinet, I have LGBTQ+, plus the first person I brought into the mayor's office was LGBTQ. I have BIPOC. Uh, I have diversity on my cabinet, and I think that's one of the best ways as a leader to show that you support diversity in your community, diversity in the city, and certainly diversity at a leadership level of a cabinet member. Mayor, last year at your State of the City address, you highlighted moving the House of Charity out of downtown as a key goal. You recently highlighted the concentration of homeless services in that area as exacerbating urban blight near the intersection of Second and Division. This week, Catholic Charities, which runs that facility, said that you have either declined to help or have actively resisted efforts to move the facility. Why has no progress been made on this issue? Well, listen, I, I uh, initiated this conversation with uh, Catholic Charities last year because, yes, I hear from businesses uh, every single day that are being impacted very negatively by the concentration of Housing First and House of Charity downtown in just a few city blocks. Uh, we worked uh, very aggressively to try to find locations. Catholic Charities has very specific specifications that they need to relocate that, um, that shelter, and they want a very large campus. So we looked at different um, locations. Two of those locations happened to be in the West Hills, and they were shovel ready. And we looked at those, and they were in, uh, under consideration until we cleared out uh, Camp Hope through the Row Initiative, the right-of-way initiative, and Catholic Charities was given money to buy the hotel on the top of Sunset Hill and convert it, and I wasn't going to deconcentrate downtown and move it to the West Hills. So we have engaged in conversations about looking for other locations. Lisa, do you agree that too many homeless services have been cited downtown, and what would you do differently to address the issue of blight? I agree that, that both downtown and other neighborhoods shouldn't bear a disproportionate share, but that part of the problem has been a concentration on larger facilities and smaller facilities would be good. Um, in the 20, 2019, homelessness debate, the mayor said under her leadership, Spokane could be a model for other cities. That has not been the case. Instead of a plan, there's been sort of an ever-changing uh, cast of characters, as well as Cannon Street open, then closed, then open, then closed again. Uh, I believe that we can bring people together and do both better outreach to the unhoused population as well as working with neighborhoods and faith leaders to come up with facilities where people can come inside. Well, let me just remind you that we did have COVID and we had a lockdown and we did everything we could to keep our unhoused housed during the pandemic. And we would normally have closed the warming center and we didn't. We housed them in the library downtown when it was closed for renovation, in the arena, and now where the Way Out Shelter is. We focused on housing the unhoused so they wouldn't be susceptible to disease or spread disease. Uh, we will be a model uh, city when we adopt a regional homeless authority. Unfortunately, my council has deferred indefinitely a decision to do that, but we will do better when we get uh, agreement from the council to help us do that. I would like a rebuttal. Uh, we have to do the basic math. Um, there are over, clearly over 2,000 visibly homeless people, only 1,000 emergency shelter beds. That number went up only by a couple hundred over the last four years. Uh, we can do better than that. I've been meeting with the Homeless Coalition. I believe there are good ideas out there. Um, it, one of them is not the track shelter. I think we should, we should divert from that. But I do believe that we can come up with uh, new solutions, and I do support a regional approach to the issue as well. 
Moving on to an audience question. What is your stance on the fluoridation of Spokane's municipal water system? Uh, Lisa, we're going to start with you. Thank you so much, Emery. Uh, I, I believe in, in fluoridation as a public health intervention. I don't believe that we've identified funds for it or sufficient public consensus. And funds are very important right now because there is a structural budget deficit and a budget deficit projected for next year of at least $20 million. So it is um, not uh, at the top of my list. Mayor. Well, my, my position on that hasn't changed. My position has been if we're going to do something that impacts every single person in the city of Spokane, like fluoridating our water does, that they should have a vote. And I know voters have turned it down three times. The last time, though, was just a little over 20 years. So uh, that definitely needs to go to a public vote. Uh, we don't have the funds. Uh, my challenger is right. We do not have the funds to do that. And let me just remind people that if we want to target a demographic of our population that needs fluoride, like young, young children, then let's spend the money to target that demographic. Less than 1% of the city's water is even ingested. So to think that that's going to be a benefit to those who need it, your cars are going to get more fluoride, your, your dishes are going to get more fluoride, your lawns are going to get more fluoride, and so is your laundry than anyone who drinks the water. Moving on to another audience question. What are your plans for restoring and sustaining the health of the Spokane River? Mayor, we're going to start with you. Well, we've done a really good job uh, over the years. We are a model for our CSO tanks. Um, that was uh, under the former administration, Mayor David Condon. We invested hundreds of millions of dollars in CSO tanks that are underground. They capture the runoff. They clean the water before it goes into the, into the river. Um, remember when we banned phosphates? Um, we, we've done some things over the years. Our, our river is our, our biggest, most important natural resource. We need to do everything we can to keep the river clean. Uh, one of our biggest challenges, though, is homeless camping along the rivers. And we have passed an ordinance, council did, to ban camping along the embankments and all of the garbage and human waste that is now going into the river. Um, that's a huge challenge uh, that it's tough to keep up with. But we need to do everything we can to keep our river uh, pristine. Ms. Brown? Well, I agree that uh, that was good work uh, by the former administration in creating the combined sewer overflow uh, infrastructure to reduce runoff into the river, but I think there's still more that can be done there. I look forward to working with the river keeper and others on, on what those measures might be. When it comes to banning phosphates, I did that in the legislature with um, then Representative Andy Billick. That was one of his first bills, and it was I was very proud as, uh, to help him as a senator uh, to get that across the finish line. I know that we um, do have, and I participate actively every year in river cleanup. I know we still have issues of, of both mining waste and we need to do um, keep moving forward with our water conservation issues. And I think there's probably more the city can do to lead on that. I know that the, the council has passed uh, rules for households, but I want to make sure that the city is kind of walking its talk when it comes to water use and reuse. Do you support creating a safe, legal place for the homeless who are living in their cars to park at night? If so, what should that look like? If not, where should these people go? Lisa, we're going to start with you. I do believe we need to go upstream. Uh, the, the unhoused population is not just a fixed population. In fact, there are people that are transitioning out of homelessness due to good work of nonprofits in our community uh, into affordable housing. However, there are more people becoming homeless. And often one of the steps before that is living in your car. So I do believe creating a place with security and services where people could, could, outreach could be done to have them come and potentially connect them to housing or reconnect them to housing before uh, they are on the street would be a good move for, um, for our community. And there are 
communities that are piloting this. So what I would do is go look and see what their experience has been, what type of operators they used, and what type of success rates they had, and we would bring that information back to the community to have this conversation. Mayor. I do not support so-called safe parking lots. Um, I don't think anyone would want them in their neighborhood. I think we should expect more for someone than uh, living in a car. A car is not a home. And we have facilities for people who want to get connected to services. And I don't think it's safe. I don't think it's safe. I also don't support camping near um, schools uh, or licensed daycares or parks. I think we need to bring people off the street and inside, connecting them to services like we operate track the Trent Resource and Assistance Center. Uh, I know there are cities on the west side of Washington that are considering that. Bellevue is one of them, but they can't find an operator. Uh, where are we going to get the money to, to fund the operations and the management of those so-called safe parking lots? I don't think there's anything safe about them. Rebuttal. Nobody's talking about safe parking lots. Um, what I'm talking about is a single place, and it would be I designed to be temporary place because we want to connect the person back to housing. The idea that we have places for them, no, we don't. Do the math. There's already a thousand more people living outside than there are spaces in our emergency shelter system. And this came to me because neighbors told me. I knocked on doors in Corbin Park and other places, and they said people are sleeping in their cars in my neighborhood, and we need to do something about that. Well, I'd like to know where you're going to put them because that's going to be a huge challenge. But I, I, I go back to an article that was in the Spokesman Review a few years ago about a, uh, a mother and a father whose daughter l died in a so-called safe parking lot in the city of Seattle. That parking lot now has been shut down. And they went to Seattle to see where their daughter died. And they said that there is no way you would ever want your son or your daughter to live in conditions like that. I just don't think it's safe. And when you say that we have a thousand more people than beds, we're not gonna have beds for every single homeless person in a low barrier emergency shelter. We have other programs that we have residential um, situations that we could, we could address their needs. The city is currently working to address an approximately $20 million hole in next year's budget. The county and the valley are not similarly in this kind of financial distress. How did we get here and how do we get out of it? Well, from what I understand, the county is facing a structural budget. The city of uh, Spokane Valley is a little bit different. They're a contractual city, so they don't have the same types of services that we do. Um, but again, the city of Spokane is not uh, unique city, uh, according to the Association of Washington Cities, which two of our council members serve on their board, more than a third of the cities in this state are facing structural gaps because revenues have not caught up with expenditures. Inflation is making things very, very challenging. We have to get back to priorities and core level services. So we're doing three things to show. I've already give, given the council, October 2nd, a proposed preliminary budget and it is balanced. So we have filled that gap. We're doing it with uh, organizational efficiencies. We are hiring, uh, we're putting a hiring freeze and we're looking at ways that we can increase revenue. I've already balanced the budget is whether or not the council approves of the way I've balanced it, uh, and we'll see what happens there in November. The way we got here is because three years in a row, the mayor introduced a budget, the council passed it, it was overspent, and one-time money was used to fill the gap. Now our reserves are drained, and we have a structural deficit. That means that expenditures are growing, faster, a couple of percent faster than revenues are growing. The mayor's budget proposal does not address the structural gap. It kicks the can down the road using another set, mostly, of one-time funds. It also makes rosy projections about sales tax revenue, um, projecting that it would be 6% year over year when it's only growing 1.9% right now. 
So the first principle of budgeting is when you're digging a hole, stop digging. And we need some real fiscal responsibility and someone who can look both long-term and short-term at options for, for creating uh, a true long-term balanced budget. Well, and we are planning strategically to make sure that the structural gap gets smaller and smaller every year. In fact, um, our team has won a national award for budgeting principles. And, and so we're working on, on some of those issues. When Lisa talks about reserves that we spent, those were reserves built up over the last several years because we had a labor contract with our police union that went four years without a new contract. And we saved money, rainy day, we saved it in a, in, a, in, a, in a bank account so that we could pay for that contract and back pay for four years for those officers. So yeah, we use those reserves, but they were planned for that specific intention. The national award was for how the document looked, not for the budgeting. The, the budgeting was not good. Um, second, uh, it's another principle of budgeting that when you uh, enter into contracts that put your expenditures higher than your revenue, you need to come forward with adjustments to the revenue at that point in time or other cuts to the budget. Um, this administration has not faced up to the severity of this budget situation, and I believe we're at risk of a downgrade in our bond rating that will affect our ability to create infrastructure that Spokane wants and needs. Nobody gets an award for the way something looks. Mayor, we're moving on. Thank you. Revenue from red light cameras and speeding cameras, uh, the tickets issued by these cameras, traditionally go into the traffic calming fund, which is typically spent on infrastructure projects such as stop signs, speed humps, things that increase pedestrian and traffic safety. Mayor, you have called for pulling some money from that fund in order to backfill the police department budget. Uh, Lisa, this question is going to be going to you first. Do you think that that's an appropriate use of those funds? No. I, one of the things I hear at the doors is that people are already frustrated that their neighborhood council approved traffic calming projects that haven't been completed yet. And so I don't think we should raid the traffic calming fund um, for um, this budget situation that we're in. Uh, and furthermore, in the reorganization of the police staffing, traffic safety officers will, were pulled back. So this has kind of been a double hit, and neighborhoods have noticed, and I've heard from North Monroe to Hilliard that they're concerned about it. So we certainly should not uh, be pulling the traffic calming funds. Mayor. Traffic calming funds started out many years ago as $50,000 per legislative district for, like you mentioned, roundabouts or speed bumps. Um, that budget now brings in millions of the, the cameras bring in, and the council continues to add more cameras throughout the city, millions and millions and millions of dollars every year. Our public works department can't even keep up with the number of projects that that would fund. They can't design them fast enough, they can't implement them fast enough, construct them, and they certainly can't maintain them. And there is nothing better than a traffic calming tool than an officer in your neighborhood. And so if we can use some of those funds which have accumulated to, I think the bucket right now is about $10 million. If some of those can go to officers, that's the best traffic calming uh, option that we can give a neighborhood. So I support that. The, the traffic calming, uh, $10 million actually doesn't go very far in terms of traffic calming projects. Uh, and the backlog is a major frustration. It's a compact that we've made with our neighborhood councils that they would come together as citizen volunteers and recommend these projects for the safety of their families. And I heard a business owner tell me personally um, how she felt it was harming her business to have um, the uh, fast speeds down Market Street. And so I think this really is a commitment that we need to keep. Uh, and I think that there are other ways that we can address um, the budget deficit. Well, let me just say, I'm not saying that I don't support traffic, traffic calming projects, but when we've got a bucket that is as uh, 
has accumulated as much money as it has, and it brings in the kind of revenue, and the priority is for more officers, I would like to see some of those funds used for officers. We can still have traffic calm. We can have both, but there needs to be a balance. On the issue of police accountability, is the Office of the Police Ombudsman currently sufficiently empowered to provide oversight of the police department, and specifically, should it have the authority to compel interviews with officers during investigations? Lisa, you'll start. I believe that we have not fulfilled the public's vision of a truly empowered and independent Office of Police Ombudsman um, that was overwhelmingly approved in the tragic wake of Otto Zem's death. And that can be strengthened However, the mechanism for strengthening it is the collective bargaining process, and that is in the purview of the administration. And so I would take action and work with our law enforcement uh, to strengthen the OPO, and I specifically believe that that investigative authority is important for assuring that the true investigations can move forward. I also support investigations of the chief. Mayor? We have strengthened the authority of the ombudsman in every contract negotiation we have passed with police. It is right now not allowed, but the ombudsman does, is not allowed to have subpoena power over our police chief and our officers. I don't support that. But the authority has been strengthened uh, every single contract that we pass. We have, as a Police Department, we are a model for the reforms that we have implemented uh, during this time. I know voters voted that overwhelmingly. They wanted police oversight. We have a police oversight commission of civilians. Our uh, ombudsman can now write closing reports. But I'm gonna tell you, if you wanna lose officers, the fastest way to lose officers or not be able to recruit or hire officers is to allow the ombudsman to have subpoena power over them and their chief and also to take away qualified immunity. I'd like to know what my challenger thinks about that. I know the AG wanted that. We didn't get, that didn't get passed at the state level, but that means that an officer could get sued just for doing their job. There is no way in heck anyone is ever going to come to the Spokane Police Department to work or wear the badge if that ever happens. Some residents in the Leita Valley are calling for a pause on new residential development because of concerns that improvements to roads, sorry, because of concerns that roads and firefighting and infrastructure are buckling under population growth. Do you support a moratorium? And can you pledge today that the needed infrastructure improvements will be completed by the end of your term? Mayor, we're gonna start with you. We have a housing crisis. I call a housing emergency a couple of years ago. We were the fastest growing county in the state in 2021 and 2022. We already had a housing supply. Uh, it was already tight and it just got worse. That's why we've seen our prices for housing go up almost doubling in some instances and people can't afford to buy a house. So no, I don't support a moratorium. What I do support is working with neighborhoods to make sure we can get that infrastructure. They're not gonna get the infrastructure unless the development happens, unless the houses are built. That's how you get infrastructure. But what I am willing to do, and what I've talked to a neighbor with neighbors in Eagle Ridge, I've listened to the neighborhood correspondence in Leita, is to start um, changing our impact fees, which were never changed for 20 years. So that's traffic impact, that's GFCs, we're updating those. Those are developer paid. You're gonna get infrastructure if development happens. We're also looking at projects that we can do on city-owned property. I know Leita wants a fire station. We are looking at ways that we can do some sewer improvements so that that is shovel-ready on city-owned property designated for a fire station so it's more attractive for state construction funds. The citizens of Leita Valley are asking for a moratorium because administration after administration has failed to make progress on the key infrastructure. There are over 3,000 new units in one or more phase of development, and there is a very real life or death issue, which is fire safety in only one road in and out of the neighborhood. So they are asking for this as a way to put pressure on the process to start putting the plans in place for that infrastructure. This idea that you do development first and infrastructure 
later is just backwards. We need to do it the other way around. Uh, neighborhoods in Spokane deserve, and Lataw Valley does not have, um, sufficient uh, egress out of their neighborhood, fire protection, transit, schools, parks. This has been allowed to happen, I agree, under previous administrations, but this administration has not put a plan in place, and I will put a plan in place. I can't Lisa, commit to having the infrastructure completed. Sorry. I wanted to answer the question. Well, again, we're, we're working on those structure fees that have not been implemented for many, many years. We can't do it overnight. We're going to phase in those fees that are being worked on right now. They are paid by the developers. And that gives you uh, infrastructure in the future, because that's all that does. Unless there's building, you're not going to get the infrastructure. Schools don't come into an area and say, we think there's going to be a population growth here, and we're going to put a school there. That's not the way it happens. But we are working on a fire station in that area because I agree, we need more fire safety. And so that's why we're looking at a city-owned property to, to locate a fire station, get it shovel ready so we can get some grants. But we don't have the money to provide all of this infrastructure right now. Rebuttal. So development fees are not the only way to create infrastructure. Uh, capital planning in the, in the city is part of that process, and working with the State Department of Transportation is part of that process. They are the ones that sent a letter to the administration early on saying we need to do something here or they will start shutting down exits uh, on to the highway. So we can work with WashDOT. There are other resources available. I've already talked with the school district. We can bring governments together and make progress on this. Earlier this year, the City Council passed a slate of landlord-tenant reforms. Mayor, you vo vetoed this reform package, though the veto was overridden by a supermajority on the City Council. Do these reforms go far enough? Should the city go further to protect renters? Or do they go too far and make it too difficult to be a landlord? Lisa, we're going to start with you. Uh, I do support the package that was passed, and I am really concerned that we are facing another wave of evictions, particularly from seniors who are living in um, subsidized housing. I, I just met with a group um, on North Division. They've been all converted to month-to-month -month leases, even if they've lived there for 10 years, and their rent's gone up twice in the last six months. And so I do think we should uh, revisit the package and make sure there's more notification before an individual can be evicted. I think that, unfortunately, the month-to-month -month lease allows the landlord perhaps not to give that kind of notice, so it's definitely something we need to take up or we are going to have seniors evicted and on the streets in Spokane. Mayor. Well, and one of the reasons that I, I didn't support it, we had many, many community conversations. We had town halls, we brought stakeholders in, we listened to the landlords, we listened to the tenants union, and my fear was that we would lose the mom and pops. The mom and pops are the privately owned uh, properties, and because they don't have a mortgage, they are willing to work with their tenants and lo offer lower rent, lower than market value. And they said, basically, if you continue to put more restrictions on us and don't give us rights as well, uh, then we're going to sell our properties and you're going to lose units. My focus was, let's, let's direct our, our, our energy on the small number of landlords that are offering slumlord conditions that aren't being good landlords over their tenants, and let's address that. Let's not do blanket restrictions on all landlords who are actually doing a great job of providing a roof over their tenants' heads. I I got to take that one on. We, we are already losing mom and pops. We are already having national uh, companies buying up rental properties. Um, this administration left affordable housing dollars on the table that they could have applied for. Um, part of her proposal is taking uh, housing investment dollars and moving that to the Trent Shelter. We have one of the tightest housing markets in the country. We have 30 to 40 percent of our population uh, constrained by their mortgage or their rent payments. Uh, and I'll just add something. We are using um, new monies, sales tax money, 1590. 
It goes to affordable and attainable housing. We are working at the city to be able to leverage those funds. We've got about 15 million right now and leverage uh, the bond against it so we can have even more funds to get more attainable housing built as quickly as possible. And we're going to be releasing that plan very, very soon. Mayor, you have criticized uh, Lisa's management of the State Department of Commerce, particularly in how that organization spent money to empty Camp Hope. You've gone so far as to say that you believe that, in part, Camp Hope was started and kept, kept open to intentionally hurt you politically. Can you speak to your thoughts on Brown's management of Camp Hope? Well, I think it was an utter failure. We spent $25 million on Camp Hope, and very few people have been permanently housed. Most of them are at TRAC, the Trent Resource and Assistance Center, which my challenger continues to criticize. Uh, it was mostly used, most of that money was used to buy a hotel, to rehabilitate that hotel, and about half of those rooms are full because nobody wants to follow the rules. Very few people were housed for $25 million. She fought to keep that encampment open. We even got sued at the city because we were, in the, were working with the county to try to move people along or into housing or clean up that encampment. 18 months, that neighborhood, a low income, mostly minority neighborhood, victimized. I bet my challenger never visited the neighbors living there or the businesses that were impacted. We needed to close that encampment. And I'll tell you one thing, I, there's encampments up and down the West Coast, but nobody ever blames the mayor for the encampments like I was blamed. So yes, it was very, very political. Lisa? Yeah, Camp Hope shouldn't have happened, and there won't be a Camp Hope on my watch. And I believe the mayor wanted homeless people out of downtown and shut down a shelter without opening another one. The commerce funding to close Camp Hope was not just for the people at Camp Hope. It was specifically designed by the legislature to expand affordable housing. And so 100 units of affordable housing was created through the catalyst facility that the mayor requested. There were about 100 units of shared supportive housing and rehousing in private apartments and about 100 shelter beds at both Hope House and TRAC. Um, 16 detox beds for compassion and addiction treatment. And people were hired as peer navigators to help connect people to the assessments and services that were required uh, by the legislation. We opened up TRAC and we were trying to get um, the people who were operating and managing that encampment who happened um, a nonprofit that got a million and a half dollars to manage that camp who created that encampment and we knew that the contracted dollars were going to end at the end of June, and that's why they fought to keep the encampment open until the end of June of this year. We could have closed it earlier. We tried to get them to encourage people to go to TRAC. They refused. They were the big, biggest critics of TRAC, including my challenger. Only now some of those individuals have actually answered the RFP to now operate the, the TRAC in 2024. You cannot make up that hypocrisy. So I, I do believe we should, uh, we should transition away from TRAC, and I don't think the city should own or lease uh, these facilities. I think we should be partnering with nonprofits and private developers and leveraging state funding. I told the mayor this personally, that a leased facility cannot receive the funding from the state from the Housing Trust Fund, up to $3 million. And so I do believe we should be transitioning away from track. It's been, a, it's been ineffective and very, very costly. The city of Spokane has committed to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and get to net zero by 2050, but has made relatively little progress actually reducing those emissions. What specifically should the city do to move the needle on this? Mayor, I believe this is to you. Well, this is, this is going to be a challenge, um, and I know we are dealing with energy codes that have been pushed out now um, that don't allow for new construction, whether it's commercial or residential, natural gas hookups. Um, our council has dictated what kinds of cars that we can buy to replace fleet. The first decision they made was to buy uh, electric cars for Teslas for our police department. Teslas don't work for the police department. Um, they weren't big enough. They weren't, um, we have shifts. Uh, officers are on three shifts sharing a vehicle. You don't have time to um, 
hook it up and, and, and uh, get it charged. So some of the decisions that I think are being made are just unrealistic. We've had a change now uh, one of the ordinances because of the required amount of electric vehicles that you can't even get anymore, and they're very, very expensive. So we're going back to compressed um, vehicles. In fact, they're going to be ordering some, uh, our police department, you'll see them driving F-150 trucks because we can't get vehicles. But some of these mandates Mayor, that's time. I apologize. are unrealistic. Sorry. Lisa? Yes. Uh, well, one of the things I would do as part of a transition process would be to convene uh, those who worked on the Sustainability Action Plan and other organizations, there are many in the community, and ask them to come up with recommendations to, to present to the City Council and Mayor for things, actionable things we can take in my um, a term uh, to move us forward on the Sustainability Action Plan. Second, I'd like to work with Avista and with uh, the Department of Commerce on energy retrofitting some of our lowest income households. We'll save them money and reduce our carbon footprint. Third, we've got to figure out what our long-term plan is for our incinerator, our waste to energy plant, because it's, it's the single largest emitter right now, and it's scheduled to um, to have the city receive a fine. So we have to make a we have to talk with the state about the carbon footprint of both the current facility and any alternatives. And I have some ideas about how we can do that. It's a economic, Lisa, it could be an economic opportunity. That's time, thank you. I'll just say our waste to energy plan is a revolutionary uh, facility. We burn our trash, we don't bury it in landfills anymore. That's the biggest emitter of carbon gas. We don't wanna go back to burying trash. Um, that facility burns our garbage and actually produces energy that we then sell back to Avista to power homes. That is technology that should not be penalized under some of these new regulations because I don't think anybody wants to go back to burying your garbage. So the greenhouse uh, gases are emitted from the facility, and we do have to work within the context of state law or pay that fine. Um, I think there are some creative ideas that we might be able to employ related to carbon capture. I've already talked to a local company about that. And there are other things we can do with respect to reducing our waste stream. Um, there's some great ideas out there about reducing our food waste, and I think we can help our uh, income-constrained households who, who would like to be part of the solution but don't have the funding for those extra green bins, and that would be a way Lisa, to achieve that goal. Unfortunately, we are out of time for additional questions tonight. I'd like to thank you both for being here and to ask you for your closing statements. Mayor, you are first. Well, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight and um, to hear the, the, the different, uh, the contrast between the two of us. Voters have a big, big decision to make in this election and there are very two different paths to our city's future. Uh, our path is one that brings people together. It elevates law enforcement to keep our community and our neighborhood safe. It listens to voters and it gets to work to accomplish the great things that we all want for our city. My challenger couldn't be any different. Look at our track record in Olympia, out of control tax and spend policies, even suing the voters to raise their taxes. She's soft on crime and supports dangerous homeless policies like the bungling of Camp Hope and so-called safe parking lots. Look, I, I'm not looking for my next political promotion. I know I'm the underdog here even though I'm the, I'm, I'm the incumbent because I don't have the political experience that I don't think you have to have political experience to do this job. We have term limits for that very reason. But I'm fighting to bring Spokane into the future, not backwards. I'm proud of my accomplishments on housing, homelessness, public safety, and economic development. And I'm asking for you one last time to vote for me for mayor. I believe government exists not to govern over the people, but to mayor. govern for the people. Mayor, that's time. Thank, Thank you. you. Lisa. Thank you. Uh, Spokane, you deserve a mayor who is an experienced collaborative leader who will find common ground, create partnerships, find resources, and get things done. I have visions and ideas for the future from effective, coordinated homelessness response to getting new fire stations and infrastructure in Five Mile and Leta Valley to bringing in more state resources for affordable housing. 
the nasty attacks by my opponent are a DC consultant's ideas of how to carry out a political campaign, go as low as possible. They are false and the public is sick of them. You can learn more about what I really stand for at lisabrownformayor.com and join us as an endorser or volunteer and I would appreciate that. The people of Spokane really want the same things for our city. Public safety, affordable housing, opportunity no matter what zip code you were born in, potholes filled and the zags in the final four. <laughs> we can find common ground and move forward together. If you give me your vote next week when the ballot arrives in the mail, we will do just that. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you.